Hello and welcome to today's Wild Hearthstone deck tech and gameplay video on Draw Demon Hunter. Draw Demon Hunter is centered around, at its core, the final showdown quest. Which actually, we'll do this so I can show all the bits of it. Where basically we want to draw a load of cards and not only reduce the cost of said cards for, you know, just generally because ramping is nice, but also you can draw a lot of cards, you have a lot of options and can, you know, generally apply pressure when you have a lot of cards to do so. We also can draw uh, apply a, a good amount of pressure from drawing all those cards in a third way with cards like the new Patches the Pilot as well as a couple copies of Son of Hodir. All of these adding whenever you say draw a card do a thing. In this case the Son of Hodir will summon an 8-8 as well as the 8-8 you get by itself. And Patches the Pilot will summon you 1-1 Pirates with Charge. Not only does this happen to populate the board with a really big body whenever you draw some cards, which your deck already wants to do, but also when you, uh, when you draw a cast when drawn spell, you draw another card, which allows you to, again, complete the quest a little bit faster. And beyond the quest itself, things that shuffle into your deck and therefore allow you to draw, we have more traditional draw spells of a wide variety like Sigil of Time, Spectral Sight, Quick Pick, and a Lesser Opal Spellstone. There's lots of cards that basically draw you cards. Since the deck wants to draw a bunch of cards, you need a lot of ways to draw cards. To do that also, and this is one of the cards that is really important and is in the glue category. Audio Amplifier is great, since you're going to be drawing a lot of cards. The fewer cards you burn, the better. You also need some forms of interaction, like some soul cleaves, to not only gain some life, but deal with boards. And really, the the biggest, um, I guess you can call it change to the deck that I made midway through uh, testing, was putting in some tradable cards. Some big game hunters, a wind-up musician, and uh, what's the last one? Speaker Stomper. These can be either the, the battle cry effect you need for any given particular moment in time, or more importantly, is just a repeatable way to draw cards with the tradable effect. Again, letting us draw more cards and therefore complete our quest quicker, ramp into, you know, big scary things and summon big boards, the usual. But also with the additional glue having effect of like a soul cleave or something like that, we can also play a big game hunter to destroy a thing if we need to. Same thing with a mind bender or a wind up musician. This is one of those where the tradable card. Ignore the mind bender, my brain. I meant the speaker stomper. This basically lets the deck have both draw and bits of tech and glue in one package, which is fantastic, and it is exactly what the deck needed. And that is basically the list. There's not a whole lot to it. We play the quest on one, we play cards that will either directly draw us cards, or cards that will draw, that will automatically play when drawn, which will therefore draw another card. And we draw all those cards, ideally summoning a big board of scary dudes, anything like Playhouse Giants, Sons of Hodier, or our tradable creatures, or even just the actual, uh, what's his name? The Demon Slayer itself is a pretty big and scary creature. So yeah, we just draw cards, summon a big board, apply pressure, and try and win. It's not a terribly, you know, complicated deck. It is a lot of fun, though, and it is kind of complicated, since you have to sort of be able to pace out and make the appropriate decision on when to draw, and how much to draw, and how much your hand space is. There's actually a good amount of decision-making in the individual moments of a game, but at its core, we just draw a lot of cards and apply some pressure. But anywho, thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like the video if you like it. Subscribe if you like my grab bag of content and would like to see more in the future. And if you have any sort of questions, like I don't have X, what about Y? For the most part, the deck's pretty budget friendly. You know, just play a good amount of draw spells and some things you want to like ramp into. And for the most part, you'll be okay. Well, that out of the way, we'll go on now to game number one. And game number one with our little uh, draw demon hunter. This is a, a perfectly fine hand. 
Of course, we always start with the quest, so we always have a turn one play. But beyond that, we just, you know, have ways we can, in theory, draw some cards. Odds are the Wind-Up Musician is going to be traded, since most, uh, most priests are like some sort of very slow, grindy quest sort of priest of any of the quests. It doesn't really matter which one. Maybe not. That's kind of the exception to the rule. Anywho, final showdown pass. The drawing of the Sigil of Time is pretty nice, since that'll by itself get us our first stage of the quest complete. Really nothing. Hang on. Draw one. In that case, we'll do two sigils. This will let us be able to... This will get us to one draw for the start of the turn, and then two and three draws from our Sigil of Alacrity, and our fourth draw can be a wind-up musician, and we can always just save the Sigil of Time until the next turn if we want to. Depending on what we draw, who knows? Sigil of Alacrity being sort of like a, a very, very mini version of kind of what the quest wants to do is both a draw spell and a ramp tool, which is like one of the... One of the uh, perks... I'm sorry, that, that threw me off. Maybe they have... Uh, what is that... Whatever that hero card is that like triggers all your death rattles again. Maybe that. I don't know. I can't remember the name of it for the life of me, but we'll figure that part out. In that case, yeah. Go ahead and trade. Getting some ramp on a son of Hodier. Very nice. I think we're just going to go face with the rest of it. Next turn, we can, unless we draw some particularly great thing like uh, like a Spectral Sight, maybe. Odds are we're going to be playing a Sigil of Time and going for the turn 5 completion of step 2. I have really enjoyed this list because it, it truly... Well, I was going to say, like, no other deck, but the creation of this deck made me make another sort of similar draw on it, like, a draw deck in another class. But originally, when I made this deck, one of the things I really loved about it is that it, it played on an entirely different, like, angle than any other deck I had ever really had any sort of experience with. And I found that absolutely fascinating. We will go ahead and play the sigil, and I still think it is. This deck is like super fun and like weirdly, like it, I know I said it wasn't. It's not a, a a difficult like a like a super complicated deck to explain in an abstract level, but like the individual play moments are like can be really granular and reward like a good degree of like understanding with the deck, and I love that. I love a deck that sort of rewards my time investment, for lack of a better word. That would have been nice to have in hand. That's something. Uh, there's no way that I'll ever... Hang on, let's think about this. So I could do... Spectral Sight first reduce the cost of patches, because I believe we drew him this turn. Play a patches. Soul Cleave now, while we can try and get something out of it. Just trying to get any amount of lifesteal back. Fingers crossed they actually buff the spirit again, so I can big game Hunter it. Which is not what I where I thought I would use this card, but hey, we take him. Honestly, yeah, as long as you just, like, buff one of the big dudes. That's all I care about. Okay, they unfortunately saw through my plan. Okay, we're in a weird spot. It has to be said. There are some outs here, but we're gonna... Well, something. That helps. Does it matter what we hit? Because, yeah, no matter... 
or well, not no matter what. So maybe we should do a hit here and a hit here, followed by a soul cleave. We don't love that. That's two. I guess we can start. Let's get the more expensive big game going back. Okay, that's something. I guess we'll throw that one back. Oh, that really is not great. In that case, we uh, I think we might just be dead. It's so unfortunate. Unless we draw, like... <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't need to draw, like, the rest of our... That's so unfortunate. Damn. Oh, right, I forgot the actual... Very well. We'll let our opponent have it. Yeah, unfortunately, like, you know, sometimes you do lose with this deck, and it's... it. It's not the greatest into pressure, but against what is the typical Priest deck, that again, that's very slow and very grindy, ultra late game focused around any of the, like, the really popular quests, whether it's like the Death Rattle one or the eventually win the game one, the deck does really, really well because it takes forever and you can sort of take your time setting up and develop a really big board and sort of do your thing. But decks that apply some sort of pressure can be a little weird depending on your draws. Though, honestly, the format it doesn't have a whole lot of the. Well, it's. Let me rephrase that. The format, in my experience, does have some aggressive decks, but by and large, it's a somewhat slower, more grindy metagame. There's not, like, really aggressive decks. And even that wasn't that aggressive. It's one of those that we could have drawn differently there. And gotten, like, lucky with draws. And maybe had a better outcome. And to be fair, the fact that they didn't uh, make one of their dudes big game hunterable was weirdly, like, like really detrimental to our game plan. But still, that's very fun. So don't let this, let this lost or whatever happens in the next game dissuade you. I think this deck is super fun, and I think you should try it. Anywho, now we'll go on to game number two. And game number two with our... Oh, this is much better opener. With our draw Demon Hunter. If our opponent happens to be running a more aggressive, almost piratey warrior, we have some tools, mainly going down swinging, to deal with it. And if it's slower, we have a couple one-cost cards and a spectral site that will eventually be in the outcast slot. This is almost one of those like late, ultra-late game. Probably has like a control warrior... What is the name of that card that, like, whenever you gain armor to gain that much attack, whatever the name of that card is, is probably in here? Because really, that, and I, I love the control, never mind, I ignore all that. I was going to say I love that Control Warrior has a finisher, but that is just throwing me for a loop. Anywho, final showdown. Next turn, since we have two one-drops, we'll just do a Patches and a Peasant, and hope the Peasant happens to live. And then one of those cards that sometimes it draws you cards and can help complete your quest, or it can apply an okay amount of pressure as a somewhat aggressive body. They're going to be playing a lot of taunts, though, so this is going to be a little weird. But anywho, Patches and a Peasant. Depending on if the peasant lives will change if I use the spectral site because we'll get one draw from the st our normal draw. A second draw if the peasant happens to live, which it looks like it's gonna. That way we can actually get two spectral sites if we don't happen to draw any of the pirates. So in that case, spectral site and just get phase one done. It's not great to draw a pirate there, but that's fine. Uh, okay, so that can be one, two, three, need another way to draw some cards, so in the meantime, let's keep going face. Granted, if the peasant lives again, we might really help, and if we draw more, and this will be a good instance now where we're in the second phase, if we do happen to draw any of our uh, uh, charge pirates, any of our charged pirates, we actually kind of want the card draw that it'll give. 
the card draw effect it will give, I should say. It doesn't directly draw you cards, it draws you cards in the abstract. Um, big game hunter first. That helps. Throw the other one back. Ah. Uh, how are we doing this? So I guess we can do a gold panner. And do a momentum. And just trade. We're going to make their Cthulhu really big and scary, but I don't think we have an option. We just have to accept it's going to suck. But luckily our gold panner will now give us... Hang on, we're going to... Yeah, our gold panner will give us the fifth draw, getting us to the second stage. Doing pretty good. Now the next draw step, like trying to get to the next stage, is going to be a little weird with the cards we have in hand. There are some things that are a little stranded, but we'll be fine. It's play, right? Yeah, it's not just summon. That helps. And this is another really good example where a couple of pirate draws do count towards the, the quest completion. It's kind of great. How do we... What are we doing here now? So we're going to draw a card here no matter what happens, right? So I guess we can do an audio amplifier. Do a quick pick. Two, three, four, five, and six, getting us the Kurtris. The big question. Yeah, we'll go ahead and run out the Playhouse Giant. Another one of those cards that loves when we draw cards. Being able to. Because you can very easily, much like a, a game like this, get this down on turn four, five, or six. And sometimes just a, you know, five or six mana eight eight is enough to apply good pressure. Yeah, go ahead and play the Curtis. Can't really ask for much more than that. I uh, guess we can play the other giant, and then we'll go ahead and trade into the other random dude. What is the name of that card? I didn't even pay attention. Let's try and empty our hand. What is his name? Azrite, whatever. Azrite Chain Gang. Okay, right. Uh, what was the old one called? I think it's Serenite Chain Gang that used to see play. They might have a brawl. But if they don't, do they just die? I don't know if they just die, but it's very close to them just dying. In that case, just go face. If we're just going to take a turn off and do a bit of a nothing burger. Okay, do, is there any way I live? So I could... One, two, three, four... Kind of. Kind of work. I guess we could do a speaker stomper to maybe slow down any potential... Uh, Uh, like like sweeper effects or brawls, or they could have the the Badlands Brawler or whatever the hell that card's name is. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna go face. If we draw another pirate that would have been summoned, like that's gonna stink. But yeah, we just want to apply pressure. They might have Reno. They've had a whole lot of weird cards, and maybe Reno's in here, so that would stink a lot. Granted, yeah, like, this is one of those decks that can struggle to deal with, you know, getting <laughs> two full health bars, especially in this case, Renathal health bars. Deck can struggle to put in that much damage. They can technically do it, it's just, it's not a good look. I don't think that matters. Or, oh, okay, I was going to say, I don't think that matters, but I can just big game Hunter that. I think we got it, right? And this is a, another fantastic example of a big game hunter being both a card that can draw you cards, air quotes, or sometimes just be removal. And then you just go face with the rest. Pretty damn good. But that just, uh, uh, that, that's another good example of that deck was one of those decks that it kind of is a little slower and 
wants to take its time doing its thing. And against a deck like that, when we can sort of be, I guess you would almost call it like a like a mid rangey pace setter, which is like what in my experience the meta is. Ignore the rank seven; the ladder just reset like yesterday. But when you get into like the golds and like low platinums, like I get to now, it's one of those. The meta is kind of slower, and against the slow meta, this deck does really really well. You can just have really huge explosive spikes that if your opponent can't answer them like answer your whole board because your big spikes are usually summoning a lot of giants and or charging pirates or whatever if your opponent can't deal with them you can just end a game on a spot which is like a good place and i still really love this deck even if i would have lost the second game i love this deck it's a whole lot of fun a thousand percent i will revisit this list when we ever if we get more like tradable cards or more like cool draw spells or something like I can a thousand percent see myself revisiting this this is one of those decks that I really love when Hearthstone leans into like unique things that it can do that like again I love magic but like a deck like this kind of doesn't exist in magic ignoring that old uh, uh, miracle or whatever that mechanics called but Hearth Hearthstone does this like this style of like really unique mechanical thing much more much better than uh like a magic would and neither one is good or bad they're merely different and that's why i play both but anywho thank you all so much for watching don't forget to like the video if you like it subscribe if you like my grab bag of content and would like to see more in the future and if you have any sort of questions like i don't have x what about y or other generally nice and or constructive comments i'll do what i can to respond to what i see Thank you all so much for watching, and you know what, just just be nice to one another, and be nice to just random people, the world's got plenty of jerks, they don't need more of them. Anywho, bye bye